Well, I think we've got one more person who's going to come on back in a moment, uh, but I think we've reached the appointed hour. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I am... As you may have guessed uh, from previous sessions, John Boyle, uh, XLA patient, uh, same as uh, many of you or your family members. And before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping, I uh, just want to talk about the surveys that we conduct to evaluate your national conference experience. Uh, you should have received an email prior to the conference with the survey link. If you didn't, we've obviously got a problem with your email address. Uh, we thank you for completing the pre-survey, uh, pre-conference survey, uh, but we're also gonna be sending out a post-conference survey where you can provide feedback on this session, on all the others, um, and uh, you'll be notified of that through the conference app as well. Uh, so thank you in advance uh, for doing that. It helps us to get better every time we do one of these. If you were with us in one of those original conferences. They were good, but they are even better now. It's because of uh, the feedback that you've given us. Uh, and of course, I would not be an IDF staff member if I did not uh, echo what uh, was said earlier about creating an EPHR and PI Connect uh, account. Uh, it is the way that we can get some great data about our unique little niche of the, uh, the PI landscape. So please, if you haven't done it, uh, we've got a lot of folks who can help you out. I use mine every week uh, when I uh, infuse, and it's easy, it's helpful, especially when I've got to go to a minute clinic, which I almost never do. Um, this is my care team. Um, so anyway, uh, questions? talk, they will answer, this is going to be fun, uh, and so now let's get rolling. Uh, this is, of course, the excellent A gamma globulinemia session. If you are not here for XLA, please be exiting through the back. Uh, there are places maybe better set for you, uh, and this session is going to be uh, presented uh, by the wonderful, the amazing uh, Dr. Howard Letterman and Dr. Elizabeth Younger. And I say that because they keep me healthy. Uh, Dr. Letterman serves as director of the Immunodeficiency Clinic and is a professor of pediatrics with. Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and is a member of the IDF Medical Advisory Committee. Dr. Younger serves as an uh, assistant professor with the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and is a member of the IDF Nurse Advisory Committee. Please join me in welcoming Drs. <laughs> Younger and Letterman. Okay then. So we have disclosures like everyone. Um, Howard has none. I do a lot of things. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, Some people have other ways to make their money. <laughs> whatever. But nothing I do is going to affect what I have to say here. Anyway, so, okay. So let's just talk a little bit about the beginning of XLA. It actually was the first immunodeficiency identified. Um, so you all were right there at the hallmark in 1952, before a lot of us were born, um, by Dr. Bruton, who was an army surgeon. Um, and basically, Dr. Bruton had a, a little boy who was eight, and he had a bone infection when he was first admitted to the hospital. Subsequently, had more and more and more infections. Um, and before he was ill, he was considered normal. Um, and for Dr. Bruton, one of the things that tipped was that he had multiple chickenpox episodes, multiple measles, and then got sick after the measles. So none of this was normal for Dr. Bruton. So he figured out that the kid had no immunoglobulin, and believe it or not, the first treatment was subcutaneous immunoglobulin. So everybody thinks that's the newest and latest and greatest. It actually, we've gone full circle, and it was the first way to treat and to provide the immunoglobulins that the patient didn't have. So that's the history, all right? So we need to know what XLA is. Basically, it's an antibody problem. You know, I get phone calls 100 times a day of patients who want to come to Johns Hopkins and be treated, and the thing that most people say is, I have no immune system, it's trash. Like, that's actually not true because nobody I'm going to use a double negative here. Nobody has no immune system. The immune system is a system, and it has multiple parts, and there's redundancy built in. And if you have no immune system, that means you're a skeleton, because your skin is the first part of your immune system. And there's multiple pieces. And the nice thing is, is that, as I said, nobody has nothing. Um, for XLA patients, it's just the antibody piece of the immune system, which is the humoral immune system. So there's no B lymphocytes, 
immunoglobulins are absent or reduced. And interestingly, the diagnosis isn't made in babies. It's made when anybody that's crossed the placenta from the mother has waned and gone away. So that's when you see patients with XLA presenting with, a, with an infection. And a lot of times, you know, maybe it's a couple of ear infections, maybe it's a wicked bilateral ear infection or a pneumonia. And Howard always says, if you're a kid, you're entitled to have a couple of pneumonias. I think your mantra is one a year, is that for kids? No, one pneumonia for decade. For decade. <laughs> Whatever. So, you know, you're entitled to have a pneumonia, and that's, and that's probably not going to raise a red flag. Um, but it's, it's the pattern and, and the recurrence and the severity of the infections that should start the neon signs flashing that maybe there's something else wrong. Um, and as I said, it's just the B cells, it's just the humoral immune system. Patients with XLA don't have problems with their T cells or cellular immunity. Most of them have no problem with their skin or their cilia or the other pieces that are all put together to keep us protected from infection. And the incidence is basically about five people in a million, five guys in a million. So Howard, it's your turn. So um, <coughs> I'm going to use this because then I can walk around. Um, this slide is, should be kind of reminiscent from Dr. Torgerson's slide this morning when he was talking about um, the immune system and Dr. Cohn talking about bone marrow transplants. But uh, this is going to emphasize a lot of the points that Beth made. So in the bone marrow, there is a um, stem cell, a lymphoid stem cell. And um, there is actually a stem cell before that, which is the, the stem cell that makes all the different elements of the um, bone marrow. Okay, so this stem cell, and it's not even on this list, makes uh, red blood cells, and this stem cell ends up making platelets. But if you think about the immune system, this is what we call the immune system. Okay, so the immune system includes cells that are granulocytes or neutrophils, you may have heard, or PMNs. Those are the uh, most um, uh, numerous kind of white blood cell in the circulation. Those are the cells that smell bacteria. They're the cells that, when they smell bacteria, leave the blood vessels and crawl out into the tissues. And if they get to one of those germs, they can attach to it and then gobble it up and then usually pretty easily um, kill it once it's, it's inside. Okay? Uh, there are monocytes. Monocytes or macrophages have the same kind of function of being able to smell bacteria and crawl to where they are and eat them. They're also really important for signaling information to the whole rest of the immune system. Okay, and these are actually the most uh, prevalent kind of cells that you have in the blood. When you get a white blood count, most of those white blood cells are these kinds of cells. And very, very few of all of your white blood cells in the blood are uh, B cells. Most of them are these. Okay, now I'm, I'm starting here on purpose because if you have XLA, you make no antibody, which is all the way at the very top, okay? But you have a completely normal number of neutrophils, and you have a completely normal number of monocytes, okay? So you're not defenseless. You don't have no immunity. What you're missing is that piece, okay? Another kind of cell that comes from, from this stem cell is a cell that's going to go to an organ in the chest that sits above the heart called the thymus. And the thymus makes a particular kind of lymphocyte called the T lymphocyte. And if we look at all the lymphocytes in the, in the blood and all the lymphocytes in the body, you have many, many, many more T cells than you have B cells. These are the cells which um, will directly end up killing a, a cell that's infected with a virus. So if you have chicken pox and you have uh, chicken pox infected cells in your skin, it's not antibody actually that that um, allows you to recover from the chicken pox. It's actually these kinds of T cells, okay? And again, if you have XLA, you're missing antibody, but these T cell numbers are, uh, these T cells are still there and they still have normal function, okay? In fact, if you have XLA and you have no antibody, uh, what distinguishes you from somebody else, let's say with chicken pox, is that you could get chicken pox once a year you could get chicken pox 20 times, 
Okay, you don't get immunity to it, so the first time you get it, you don't have antibody, and the next time you're exposed, it's like the first time, so you can get chicken pox again and again and again. But the good thing is that your recovery from chicken pox is gonna be just the same, actually, as anybody else, because most of that recovery depends not on antibody, but on these cells. Okay? Um, the other thing that T cells do is that they, they um, are what are called helper cells. And these are kind of the conductors of the whole immune system. So those are the cells that will uh, tell all the other cells in this network, actually, exactly what to do and how to do it. And to give you an idea of how important these kinds of cells are, these are the cells that are killed if you have HIV infection and all the kind of immune defects that occur in people who have HIV are not because they kill off the B cells or they kill off these cells, but because they kill these cells and these cells control everything else. Okay? And questions, if they come up, please just, yep? Uh, well, so I was going to get to that. Oh, so no, that's that's yeah, okay. No, that's perfect. We that's want perfect. That conversation exactly to be perfect. Ongoing. So um, the protein that is responsible for XLA called BTK is a protein that's expressed mostly in B cells as they develop, and we know exactly what it's supposed to do in those cells. It actually turns out also to be expressed in neutrophils, those PNNs. And it's not uncommon that if you have a severe infection, that your neutrophil number, for reasons we don't really still understand very well, your neutrophil number can go down, okay? I'm gonna bet on gamma globulin that he probably hasn't had a low neutrophil count since the beginning, or he rarely has that, Yeah. okay? There are a few patients who have low neutrophil counts no matter what, but only a few. But mostly, once you start getting treated with gamma globulin, you don't have that effect on the neutrophil, okay? And even when the neutrophil number is low, the, the neutrophils that you have work, okay? That, so that usually tends to be limited to, um, to early on in the diagnosis. So that's a good point that I had not mentioned before, okay? Um, the last kind of cell that, um, that comes out of this that's a part of the immune system is the B cell. And the B cell is the cell that doesn't develop in a normal way when you have X-linked A gamma globulinemia. So like every other cell in the body, the, the B cell has to go through a number of different stages in order to mature. And the most important thing that a B cell has to do is it has to rearrange its genes in a way to be able to allow it to make antibody. And in the process of that gene rearrangement, um, that process requires the expression of a protein called BTK, Bruton's tyrosine kinase. And if you don't have that, you are stuck, and well, I think we're gonna have another slide in a minute, but you are stuck in the process of developing this cell from what's called a pre-B cell all the way down to a B cell that can make antibody. Mm -hmm. Yes. If they have normal T cells, why do we see uh, the XLA taking longer to get over colds and viruses? And when <clears throat> my children back in the 80s were first diagnosed, they were concerned that if they got chicken pox, they would be a more severe case because their brain goes along for a day long hospital home now. They required the vaccine. So would we not have seen recovery time to be the same if they had normal T cells? Well, so I. I gave you that information about chicken pox and recovery from chicken pox. Every single infection that we have, your, your um, host defense against that infection depends on actually all of those cells, okay? So for some bacteria, you depend a lot on neutrophils and antibody. For some infections, uh, like a cold virus, you may depend for that particular virus or the flu virus, you may depend on antibody as well as some T cells, okay? There are some viruses, uh, polio virus is a great example, where probably the entire defense mechanism for polio virus is actually B cells and antibody, and there's probably very little role for anything else. The opposite extreme is TB, 
where TB, almost all of your defense depends on monocytes or macrophages and T cells. And people with TB, actually, no matter how bad of a case of TB you have, you never make antibody to it. Antibody has no role in that. So most, most kinds of infections, um, your, your ability to recover from them and your immunity so that you don't get it again depends on lots of different parts of the system and not one exclusively. Mm -hmm. um, how does the flu shot and the TB uh, testing enter into that? Like my son, at certain times he had to be TB tested and he's always been not negative. If he does get... Uh, no, no, so the, the TB test does not rely on antibody. So a TB test is just as reliable, it's just as, re no, no, the TB test depends on uh, whether your T cells have been exposed to TB before, okay? And so anybody here who has XLA or has a child with XLA, that TB test is just as reliable for them as it is for anybody else, okay? If they had TB, their TB test would turn positive. If, if, if somebody has a question about whether they have TB and they give them a TB skin test and it's negative, you can be just as comfortable that they don't have TB as anybody else. The TB test is completely reliable. It does not depend at all on antibody. The difference is for other diseases, like for example, the virus that causes mononucleosis. All right, so if you don't make antibodies, what they do is they do a monospot. You go to <laughs> urgent care because you're tired, and well, we'll do a monospot. Well, anybody with XLA is not, if they're not on gamogadin, they are, that's a different issue, is not going to have a positive monospot, even if they have fulminant mononucleosis, because they don't make antibodies. To test for some viruses, you have to do a different kind of a diagnostic test. I'm sorry? That's true for um, the one that causes ulcers in the stomach. Helicobacter? Yes. Any test, so any test. any test that relies on a patient, on a person making an antibody response, that kind of test is going to be unreliable in somebody with XLA. So mononucleosis is a great example. If you have mono and you have XLA, all the usual ways that we use to make that diagnosis depend on the patient making antibody, and they can't. If you have XLA and you're on gamma globulin, you have the antibodies from about 30,000 normal people, and 80% of all of us get mono by the time we're about eight. Okay, so I can guarantee you that any person with XLA who's getting gamma globulin will have antibody to EBV, okay? But that doesn't mean that they have an active mono or EBV infection. Right. So if you want to figure out if somebody who can't make antibody has an infection, you can't use an antibody test. Okay. Now, fortunately, now there's lots of other ways to make a diagnosis. So depending on the, on the infection, you could make a diagnosis by culture. You could make a diagnosis lots of times these days by uh, DNA tests, the same kind of things that those CSI programs use all the time to find, you know, Who's the one who actually killed the person? Um, who's the one who raped the, you know? So the same kind of DNA tests can be used. So we can do a DNA test to find out if, you, if, if somebody with an antibody deficiency has mononucleosis. But you can't rely on any of the standard tests. And that's really, really, really important because the people, those of us who specialize in these patients remember that. And if you go into an emergency room, or you go to most primary care doctors, they are used to testing for mono, as an example, a certain way, because that's the way they learned in medical school, but it doesn't work, okay? If you get really sick and you're in the hospital with an infection and people can't diagnose it, you have to be really careful to ask, how are you trying to make the diagnosis? If you're trying to make the diagnosis with an antibody test, that's gonna be a problem. And then I had to do a quick check and say, wait a minute, there's the gamma. <laughs> yeah. That's Actually, right. I mean, I get phone calls from my colleagues because all the time, Dr. Beth, I have mono. You know, the 60,000 people who gave their plasmas for your gamma globulin had mono, but I guarantee you don't, yeah. Yeah. Everybody who gets gamma globulin will have a positive, a weak positive, but they will have a weak positive test for lupus. Okay? 
Yeah, everybody has a weak positive test for lupus. Okay, but doesn't mean you have lupus. So you have to be really, really careful about that. Hmm? Uh, I have a question as far as um, uh, vaccination goes. Um, my my lean fold over is it basically is non existent. Once I receive a shot, is how they tested it. Um, and then waited for you know, one month, two months, three months mm -hmm. to see what the mean fold over was. And mm -hmm. there really was a way. Right. Is that, is that also common? Yeah, right. if you don't respond to it, that's right. too. We're right. getting that's about, oh, I'm sorry. that's about, no, no, okay. don't interrupt because I told you to interrupt. But that's about six <laughs> slides down the road. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about that. All right. Thank you. Talk about BTK, please. All right, so. Um, he really doesn't have anything I <laughs> I have to be really, really careful because I have both my real wife, who's back in the audience, <laughs> and, and my work wife. <laughs> so um, I'm really in a very uh, uh, tough spot here. I have to really be careful with the case. All right, so. The first thing actually for me to tell you about is that Bruton's tyrosine kinase was named for Colonel Bruton, who made that diagnosis of that little boy who had no gamma globulin. Um, it, it, a kind of not well-known fact actually is that child probably did not have X-linked A gamma globulinemia. He actually had common variable immunodeficiency, but he had really severe hypogamma globulinemia, but they named this protein for, him, for Colonel Bruton anyway. So um, this protein BTK is expressed only at a very specific time in the development of B cells. It's expressed at the time when the B cell is immature and it's starting to make its immunoglobulin or antibody molecule, and then it's shut off. Okay, and uh, that's actually really important because it's, it's an important concept when you think about potential therapies for XLA. So um, Dr. Cohn this morning talked about gene therapy, at least some of you may have been in that room, but, but there are ways of um, inserting normal genes into those stem cells and then getting all the cells in the, in the bone marrow to have the correct gene instead of the wrong gene. So for, um, for a gene like BTK, that's a huge problem. So right now, well not I, but, but people who do this, could make a copy of a normal BTK gene. We could get a virus, we could infect stem cells, and I could take uh, John Boyle right there. I could take some um, cells out of his bone marrow. I could culture them in the lab with this virus and I could put the BTK gene into his cells. Okay, the problem is when I put the BTK gene into the cells, it's in the on position all the time. We're not smart enough yet to figure out how to put it in and then have it under regular control so that it goes on only in a very specific time, which is when these B cells are immature. And if you have that on constantly, it's almost a guarantee that we will end up causing a B cell to turn into a leukemia or a lymphoma. Okay, that's why nobody's doing gene therapy yet for X-linked A gamma globulinemia. It's, it's a little trickier, maybe a lot trickier than gene therapy for some other diseases. You have to have not just only the right amount, but it has to be the right amount in one specific kind of cell and only as that cell is developing in the bone marrow and not once it's gotten out. If that BTK continues to be expressed, the uh, B cell will start revving up and revving up and revving up and eventually will turn into a leukemia or a lymphoma. So that does not mean that gene therapy is not gonna be possible. I would expect for a five-year-old that uh, well within uh, uh, the life of that uh, boy, we're going to have figured out how to do this, okay? But this is a much trickier kind of a um, gene therapy than something like um, ADA, which is what Dr. Cohn talked about this morning, where every cell in the body makes some of that protein. And even though you only need this much to be normal, if you make this much, there doesn't seem to be any problem with making extra ADA but there's almost certainly a big problem if you make too much BTK. If you make it in other cells other than B cells, 
and even in the B cells if you make it at times other than some very specific time. Okay, um, so before we get off of this, there are lots and lots of ways of suspecting that somebody has XLA. So the usual story is that you have uh, a little boy with lots of infections, and when you do a physical exam, they have um, little or no tonsils. They don't have very many lymph nodes. That's because B cells love to live in tonsils and lymph nodes. Those are B cell organs, unlike the blood, which is a T cell organ, okay? So you get somebody with lots and lots of ear infections and sinus infections or bronchitis, and you have somebody with, um, who's a boy who starts getting these problems in the first couple of years of life, and you do an exam and you don't find tonsils, and then you send some blood to the lab and you say, are there any B cells? and the lab calls you up because they can't find any, okay? That is 99% of the time X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. But it isn't X-linked A-gamma globulinemia 100% of the time. And the way you go from 99% to 100%, no, I want you to go back to the okay. previous slide. I, here I am being too, too efficient. Okay, the way you go from 99% to 100% is that you, either look for this BTK protein, or usually what we do now is we send blood to the lab and we ask them to sequence the gene, and we ask them to see if there's a misspelling in the BTK gene. Okay, now, if anybody here has XLA and you don't know you or your child's mutation, you need to go back to your doctor and make sure you get that. Okay, and there's lots and lots of reasons for doing it. Okay, number one, as I said, about one in a hundred people that we think have XLA actually don't. And it makes a huge difference because if you have an X-linked disease, we're gonna talk to you soon about the way in which it's inherited. If you have an X-linked disease, the person with XLA can pass that disease on. The mother who has the same has the XLA mutation as a carrier and can pass it on to other children. All the other forms of congenital agamma globulinemia that are not XLA are inherited in a completely different way. And the genetic risks and the chances and the way that it's transmitted is completely different. Okay? If you know the mutation, you know what the what the risks are for transmission. If you know the mutation, you can take any other woman in the family who might potentially be a carrier, and for a very small amount of money, you could test any other female to find out if they're carriers and if they could possibly transmit that to somebody else. If you know the mutation, you could do gene diagnosis during a pregnancy and know before the baby is born whether another baby is gonna have this. If you know the mutation, you could, again, this all depends on you know, your uh, ethical religious belief structure, but you could do in vitro fertilization. You could let the eggs grow until there's about eight stages the cell, the fertilized egg has divided and divided and divided and there are eight cells. And amazingly, you could take one of those eight cells off <coughs> and test it to see if, if that baby is gonna have XLA. And then you could choose, if you, if you wanted, you could choose a fertilized egg that does not have that XLA mutation. And you could implant that into the mother's uterus and get a normal baby. It's always mind-boggling to me that you could take one of eight cells off, okay, and it doesn't cause any problems, okay? But there's lots of different things that are possible, but those are only possible if you know the mutation. And for anybody who has a disease like this that's inherited, I think it's really important that people confirm the diagnosis, have a mutation, 
have a discussion with their doctor or a genetic counselor so that they're clear about what the inheritance pattern is, and that anybody in the family that wants to know, in this case as an example, if they're a carrier, have that information. All right? So just how many people in the room could say that they know the, the mutation? So I'm guessing that there's people here that, that where it might not be known, or they or maybe it's known but they don't know it. Okay? Out of curiosity, so when we did do this and they told us they did the genetic testing we did that told us that it was XLA. Am I right in understanding that even on the X chromosome where the mutation is for other XLA patients could be different than the one you that yes. Yeah, so, yes. Okay. So everybody, so everybody, everybody has their own. Yeah. Everybody, essentially, everybody has their own mutation. And then what would we be like? So I, we were told, I'm pretty sure, where what it is, and you know, it's kind of a bit of a blur. But how? What do we need to know to know that we know what the mutation is? Is that like? So you should ask. You should mutation? honestly, you should ask your doctor okay. for a copy of the report. Okay. That's a really important thing. It's, it's like um, having your marriage license. It's like so, having your passport. Yeah. So if we okay? did, as a family, we did the 23andMe testing, and you can drill down into that and get into all the DNA and the links and, I mean, just the string, the yeah. binary numbers, but it was string. Sure. Is that in there? If I yeah, had to read it? have a discrete set of, of numbers and right. letters that's, that's what the mutation is. Okay, so then we, we have access. I, I don't know what the 23andMe report, if your 23andMe report came back and said. It doesn't say it, but you do get all the strings. Of that. Yeah. You, have to, you so just have to know how to read it. Yes. Getting all those strings mm -hmm. is like getting a, uh, a huge library that's all written in Chinese, only you speak English. Right. Right. Okay, so you really should ask your doctor. I really believe that every patient where we know this, and XLA we do know, we know what the gene is, we know the protein, that, that having that specific pedigree, knowing exactly what your mutation is, is really important. It, it's going to be important when we get to the point of being able to fix the genes. But even now, it's important because somebody in the family may want to know what their status is for being a carrier. And if you have that specific information, that carrier test is very, very inexpensive. Okay? Um, it's important if, if a couple want to have another baby and they want to think about some kind of prenatal testing. Okay? But that's just as important, I think, as a passport or a driver's license or any other kind of specific identification card. Yes? Um, so are they mutually exclusive to demonstrating an absence or detecting a mutation? So if you were at the lecture this morning about genes. We were. Oh, okay. Well, let me just recap. So there's different kinds of things. There's misspelling. There's nonsense spelling. There's letters, sometimes letters missing or letters that are there. So each mutation is a little bit different. Okay. Um, so not every XLA patient in this room has the exact same mutation as their neighbor. As I said, some have misspelling, nonsense spelling, letters missing, extra letters, whatever. So if you can, so our son will have a mutation, it, it's not that he has an absence of them? It, it may be. Uh, sometimes I mean, we have a patient who has kind of a leaky mutation, and he's got a little bit of some immunoglobulins, and he confused us initially because we were like, oh, well, he can't possibly have XLA. Well, he sure as heck has XLA. But his mutation's a little bit different. It's not cut and dry. It's a little bit leaky. Yeah. Let me, let me see if I can explain this from scratch a little bit. So we all, every one of our cells is full of, chrom has chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes. Okay, and each one of those chromosomes has on it a whole string of genes. And each gene is spelled with a, a four-letter code, A-C-T-G. And the particular way that those four letters are put together will tell the cell exactly how to make, in this case, the BTK protein. And a mutation means that there's a misspelling somewhere in the code for this protein. 
most of the time, the misspelling ends up killing the whole protein production. And most of the time, there is no protein. Okay, not all the time, but most of the time. Um, knowing that there's no protein would make me 100% positive that that person had X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. But without knowing the mutation, without knowing exactly what the misspelling is in the DNA, you can't do any of this genetic testing. You can't test for carrier states. Okay, and so that's the reason that I think this is really, really important. Yes? You can't test for carrier, like, um, I was tested in NIH in 1991. Mm -hmm. So they don't say, you know, I'm definitely a carrier. He has a BTK problem. That's not enough. You need to know the BTK mutation. Is that what you're saying? Uh -huh. So I don't know if you know that from 1992. Um, in 1992, I think they probably did. Okay, and you could get in touch with with NIH. Okay, or you could or you could send this off. It's not this particular gene is not that expensive to sequence. It's not a huge long gene. Just to put this uh, mutation in context values for our case, we have a patient who had been diagnosed years ago who had been treated with IG, uh, who has done the uh, assessment and. and, and testing for that, what would you gain for knowing what sort of mutation you have from there on? What would kind of different be in their life, in his life, to know what sort of mutation he has? It may, well, it may have an effect down the road when we get closer and closer to gene therapy in terms of, of how we're going to modify his gene to cure him of the disease. But it also has larger ramifications for his family whether he has sisters or whether his mom has sisters. Um, it's very easy if you know exactly where to look to find if somebody is a carrier. If you have to, to sequence a whole, a whole genome or whatever, it's much harder, but it's very unique, it's very discreet, and very easy if you know so exactly you, where to look. What you're saying is that with his results, we could say my daughter's <coughs> had, um, say, Check for this if she's a carrier. Yes. And then we'll be able to Absolutely. Yes. That, will have, that will have ramifications when she wants to have children of her own. Absolutely. Yes? I worked in the lab before, so I know um, if you don't know the mutation, you need to sequence the whole thing trying to look for what's wrong. But if you know what's wrong, then you can create a um, primer that's specific to that mutation, to that change. So it's very easy to look for. But it's not, it's, not, it's not just that. So as an example, you have a, a son with XLA, okay? He's been treated, he's been thoroughly treated with Q. Right, and it may not, it, so it may not make a difference for his treatment, at least not right now, to know his specific mutation. But if you have daughters, okay? If you could say to a daughter, we've tested you and you're not a carrier and you can't possibly pass this on, or you say to a daughter, you know, you're a carrier and we're going to talk about what the risks are. Um, if you know that you have a daughter who's a carrier, then um, the pediatrician for that baby needs to know that this is a risk. And then they can test for it and be prepared. But the mutation of a patient, like my son, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the same mutation of my daughter. Yeah, yeah. In, no, 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 no. So the mutation in a family is the same. Okay. So any, almost any misspelling in a gene could cause this disease to occur. But what happens is that there is there's a misspelling. It usually occurs in the egg. Okay, there's, there's a mutation that occurs or, or a, an error in copying, basically. Okay, and then that becomes part of the genetic uh, fabric of, of whoever gets that egg and then it gets passed down 
you know, er, into um, children of that woman. And, 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 that, and that mutation record should be available by the time they give the, the initial uh, diagnosis. Is that correct? Or do we have to retest for it? And you have to test for the genetic mutation. You, you only have to test for it once. Well, it's not going to change. It's not going to change. All right. And I don't know. There are, again, not everybody has their, their diagnosis confirmed by a mutation. But I think it's really important that it's done. But if, if I, for example, our, our stone, um, secondary can see, like, you have usually like, they congestion. <laughs> it's different than other excellent patients because the other mutations can be different and could be affected. Um, it's p mostly the mutations will cause the body not to be able to make any BTK protein. And it probably doesn't make any difference which part of the gene is misspelled. As long as the misspelling messes up the protein and you have none, you have XLA. So it's not like I could look at the mutation and say, ah, because of this mutation, you're going to have a lot of sinus problems. And because of this mutation, I don't think you're going to have sinus problems. We, we, that's not the case. John, you have a question? Yeah, just a quick one, a little bit of a throwback. Um, and not to make it a leading question, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But with things like 23andMe, I've heard other physicians say, hey, it's interesting, but take it with a big old grain of salt and or, you know, really go specific. What do you feel along those lines? The 23andMe gives you an extraordinary amount of data. They don't interpret the data, and they don't have to understand the data. And it's playful. I mean, it's mostly playful. Like, we did it real, real, real. Yeah. Yeah. But, so but, family. But this, this is for others. We heard it's an issue that for those who are searching for a diagnosis with an immune deficiency where sometimes they will kind of start with something like that. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an alphabet soup, essentially, and you have to be able to figure out what it all means, and, and that's where the translation problem I, comes. You know, 23andMe, I think, at this point, is good if you're trying to figure out if your um, grandparent or great-grandparent came from Ireland or came from, um, I don't know, Norway. Okay, I think it's pretty good for that. Uh, sometimes they can find something that they will say, you know, you're at high risk for, I don't know, Alzheimer's disease or something like that. So for certain kinds of mostly common issues, okay, so ethnic background, some very common diseases, cystic fibrosis, they might be reasonable about, okay. This disease is occurring in <coughs> five people out of a million. Okay, this is not one of those common things that 23andMe is going to be good for, unless you know exactly where you're looking, and you get the raw data, and you have somebody that can help you interpret the raw data. Okay? So, um, when you get the raw data for one gene, it, let's say it's, you get 10,000 letters, okay? And you have to be able to, to say, are those 10,000 letters the same as what we call normal? All right? And I will tell you that there are lots of variations which don't kill the gene function. It's a variation. It changes one amino acid and it doesn't really make a big difference. Sometimes there's a change and it doesn't have any effect at all. So um, usually you need to have a lab that just does this. And that is what we call CLIA approved, which means that it's been approved by the government as a lab that's, whose testing is standardized and inspected and approved to be used for um, treating and diagnosing people. And that's not the case for 23andMe. Okay, we'll, we'll go on that first. Um, would those tests still be accurate after treatment? Yes, yeah. treatment will have nothing at all yeah, to do okay. with, the, with, the, with the test. Yes? Um, in our experience, um, it's not just the B cells that don't mature, but the fabric of the blood that kills them. Whether it's, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, just from science, I'm thinking, the base or acidic or whatever, but 
David was tested where they took his blood and put mature B cells in it, and his blood killed all those B cells. So it keeps on um, running through my mind. Yet if he could make a full B cell, would it even work because would his blood not kill him? So I'm not aware that that should ever happen in somebody with X-linked agamma globulinemia. So do you, the question would be, when you have something where it's not kind of typical, again, is there a, do we know for sure that, that's, that it's really XLA and is there a mutation? Okay, so I don't know, I don't know anybody who has XLA where there's something in the blood that kills somebody, some other kind of B cells. That's, that's, that would just make me wonder about the diagnosis. Okay, let's let's go on. Yeah, I'll just say that the stem cell goes through a variety of different steps to get to what we call a mature B cell. This is the B, This is the kind of a cell that has an antibody on its surface that can recognize some kind of a foreign protein, and that will then produce, under normal circumstances, IgG or IgA or IgM immunoglobulin or antibody. And when you have uh, an absence of BTK, the cells get stopped at this stage. This is all occurring in the bone marrow. And when you look out in the blood, you don't see any B lymphocytes. So we're going to talk a little bit about inherit. I go here. So we're going to talk a little bit about inheritance, and this is really important because it has to do with what we were just talking about in terms of knowing your mutation and having the possibility of passing the disease on to people in the same generation or the next generation. It, it's kind of interesting. One of our colleagues, with whom we used to work, um, is one of those people that loves to go into old graveyards. <coughs> And that's what he does on a Sunday afternoon. He goes for a drive and, and sees an, and kind of an interesting character. But, but, sees, but nevertheless, he's fascinated by it. And he was on the eastern shore of Maryland on the Chesapeake Bay and discovered a lovely old churchyard and went into the churchyard. And he was caught unawares by a line of tombstones from little boys, all from the same family against the fence. And we actually know subsequent members of that family um, generations later and we have XLA in that family. So the important thing to know is that yes, it's on the X chromosome, which means it comes from the mother. The father has nothing to do with passing on XLA at all. The mother has one X chromosome that has the defect on it and one X chromosome that's normal. So each time she gets a chromosome, there's a 50-50 shot of passing a normal X chromosome or an abnormal X chromosome. The important thing to know is that it's not a cumulative thing. It's every single time, every single conception, every single pregnancy is a one-shot deal. It's just the same as if I have six children, I should have three boys and three girls. Not. Every pregnancy is different. So you could have four boys with XLA. You could be a carrier and have four normal boys. It's rolling the dice with every pregnancy. It's not cumulative, and that's important to know. Um, so, so each pregnancy, there is one quarter chance of having a child, a boy with XLA, one quarter chance of having a normal boy, one quarter chance of having a girl that's a carrier of the disease, and one quarter chance of having a normal girl. And that's what goes back to what we were talking about five, 10 minutes ago in terms of knowing what the mutations are and knowing where to look so that you can make decisions about passing on the disease and future generations that people need to know. And we have boys all the time that have sisters and we had one in clinic last week. The sister is now in her late teens and she needs to be tested because she needs that information. She needs to be able to make informed decisions about her own children. So that's the way an excellent disease is, is passed on and it's really important to understand that. 
But before we go on, so there's a few other things here. So this is the patient with X-linked gay gamma globulin. Okay. So can that young man pass on the disease to his son? To his daughter. No. So he can't. This this person with that color, you or your child, okay, will not if if this person ends up making a boy. The reason that there's a boy is because he's contributed the Y chromosome, which is normal. So his sons are all normal. <coughs> okay? His daughters will all be carried. And carriers do not have symptoms. Okay? Now, for, I would say, especially in 2017, that the risk of having a carrier grow a baby is really tiny because I'm really sure we're going to be able to figure out how to fix this gene before that baby grows up. Hopefully it will take a while and not have a teenage pregnancy. But so this <laughs> man, as long as, as long as this girl waits for some reasonable amount of time, um, that we really should be able to do a lot of things to make um, make it not so important to be a carrier. But I know chances are very, very, very not likely. But if the affected male had a baby with a carrier mother, yeah, but let's say that uh, this patient happens to meet another affected person in the youth program defying all the <laughs> 20 years from now. <laughs> can I connect with that? I guess I would say that if you have XLA, that dating a girl from a family who also has XLA is too much like dating a cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not a good idea. The chances of that happening are just meeting somebody at random who is a carrier is extraordinarily small. Okay? It's not zero. It's, uh, if the risk of having uh, XLA is about five in a million, then, then I'm just saying five in a million boys, okay, then the risk of meeting a carrier are probably something like 15 out of a million. All right? So I can tell you that your risk of two people getting together and having a child with cystic fibrosis or a child with all kinds of things are tremendously, tremendously higher. So I don't think that's not a risk that I would terribly concerned about. But again, maybe if this meeting, okay, if you have teenage or, 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 uh, or young adults, um, they may be better off making good friends with people not in this room. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to be as nice as I can. You can be good friends, but just not that good friends. Have there been any studies, because like from my generation on, we're a hundred percent XLA boys. And it's like nuts. We have seven in the family. And so that's all it's all rolling the dice. Okay. It truly is. Because every pregnancy has the same chances. Oh I'm thinking at some point it's gotta Yeah, I, I, yeah at some point it's gotta be, you would think. You would think yeah. But probably should buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, my question is, is opposite of that, we have the first one that we know of in the family. I have a brother on my mom's side, she has a sister, there are two male cousins. And I was wondering, like I thought maybe it's 50-50 that I am a carrier or there was a mutation to the egg. Is that, so, like I might not be a carrier, but I might have had an egg mutation. Right, it's called a de novo mutation, which is the first time it arrived. So that I just magically have. Well, so you can buy the lottery ticket. I just, so, that's the negative one. Well, no, but again, that goes, that goes back to the mutation issue. So if you know your, your son's mutation, mm -hmm. then all you have to do is have you tested 
if you're tested and you're a carrier, number one, that tells you the risk that you have of having another uh, And I do have another boy who does not have which, which right. does not rely on yeah. 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 yeah, but then you know, but then you know what the risk is for the next six kids that you have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and and um, the other thing is, if it turned out that you were negative, then you know that that was a new mutation in that particular egg. Mm -hmm. It means that you are not at risk of having this happen again, and that you don't have to worry about your sisters or any of the other females in the family having a risk of being carriers either. Or my daughter? No. If but you're not a carrier, if I'm not a carrier, your daughter certainly not a carrier. She would not be a carrier. Right. right. Okay. So again, that, those are all the reasons that knowing that pedigree and then talking to somebody, and it sometimes is your doctor, and it sometimes you know, counselor does a good job of right. it. And sometimes you're better off sending that that I mean, is that where you go then? Like, where would I go to do my testing so that it's not exorbitant for thousands of dollars to do it? Your physician can refer you to a genetic counselor. counselor. Yeah, but if, if, if your doctor knows your son's mutation, mm -hmm. okay, they can order a lab test for you. They give you the, the mutation report. They probably send the blood to the same lab yeah. and say, just look for this misspelling. In your blood. Yeah. It's probably less than $200. Yes, yeah. um, Okay, so I'm an explain patient of 40 years. I've never been to a national conference. I'm glad you're here now. Good for you. <laughs> um, well, my daughter is sick, and so if she, 30 years from now, has kids. Um, <laughs> No, he's from Arkansas, I'm from New York. What? What? But my mom said they answer the same thing. Is that what that point? When there is consanguinity, the chances are that these, these are combinations of things can happen. If you have the same gene pool on both sides. Well, that's what it said when they told us when we were getting married. He said, no, 100% chance you will never have a child from New York. We got married and had two. My daughter, when she was pregnant, had been rolled up. My, my, my. So I just wondered if that's, you know, when they said all of us are related. Can that, can, know that, that can that be if you have the the same side? I mean, too much for my family history, but I come from a very small Greek village, and I do know in our family tree we have it goes back several generations into brothers, and my. Um, uh, into my grandparents who came from Greece. They crossed. Yeah, so for this particular disease, no. it's not an issue. Okay, for you. diseases that are inherited, <laughs> if there are diseases that are what are called autosomal recessive, which means to get it, you have to inherit a misspelled gene from your mother and a misspelled gene from your father. And those are the times where being cousins no, good are, idea. are going to make a difference. Okay. Um, that's not the case. I mean, the only way that this would work, I guess, if you had, um, if you had enough, of, if you had carriers that, well, that's just, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Do you want to move on to this? Yeah, but I, I, I just want to try to get through some. We should get through some content. We'll have plenty of time to come back to this. So go ahead. Do you want to? All right. So um, the thing that's interesting about um, XLA, this is a defect that occurs 
pre-natal. Okay, the fetus never makes B cells. The fetus and the newborn baby is never able to make antibodies. But we rarely, 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 rarely have problems with infections in people with XLA until they're about six months old. And the reason for that is that in every normal full-term pregnancy, the placenta will pump IgG from the mother into the baby. So if you have a baby who is aganoglobulinemic, at birth, that baby has actually a higher IgG level than his mother. All babies come out at full term with a higher IgG level than their mother because the placenta pumps all that antibody in. And if that antibody hangs around for a while, hangs around for, depending on how much antibody you need, provides protection for um, at least six and sometimes up to 12 months of protection against certain kinds of infections. So if you look at a whole group of people that have XLA, what you see is that very few of them have um, infections in the first couple months of life. And usually things start to get to be a problem when kids are, are over six months. Okay, and that's usually when they start getting into trouble. Question? When a patient with the XLA doesn't have the IG levels, you have non detectable PPM in the blood, right? Mm -hmm. But when they are babies and they get all these they amounts, they so they amount. get levels of 10,000, 50,000, and million PPM in the globulin? They have it from their mom. It's, it's when the maternal antibody starts going away, they're not making their own, so the infection starts. But I thought the life. Of that IG, they don't like three weeks or something like that. Right. How long it can live longer on a baby? Well, it doesn't live longer. So every three weeks, half of the of that IgG breaks down. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the next three weeks, you're down to a quarter, and you're down to an eighth of what you have. And, all right. For preventing some infections, you need only a tiny little amount. So I can tell you that um, normal babies, unimmunized, do not get measles in the first year of life. Because even though that antibody has gone down by a half, a half, a half, and there's very little left, there's still enough antibody to protect you from measles because you don't need very much. Now for the more common things like ear infections, uh, or pneumonia, you need more antibody. And so by the time you're three, four, five months old, the antibody levels you've got from your mother are low enough that you're already starting to have problems. For certain viruses, you need very, very, very small amounts of antibody. But you're right, in general, the IgG lasts about three weeks. Or half of the IgG lasts about three weeks. So, this is a child that um, we diagnosed, and it was a two-year-old who presented with a severe pneumonia on both sides of his chest. And this is a pretty classic story. He was pretty fine his first year of life. Didn't have terrible ear infections, didn't have a lot of illnesses until he was about a year old. And then it was sort of like the snowball rolling down the hill. He got one ear infection, then another, and another, and it just increased in frequency, they increased in severity. He also had some other uh, symptoms of chronic congestion and a schnobbly nose. Um, schnobbly. <laughs> it's a great word. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Exactly. This kid also had a bacterial skin infection three separate times. Very unusual for a 12 year, 12 month old child. So, in the lab, he had plenty of white blood cells and there's what we call the differential when we look at white blood cells. And if you have more of one kind of white blood cell than another, that's a sign that you may have something going on. And if you have lots of neutrophil poly PMNs, that's usually the sign that there's a bacterial infection going on. So that's what this child had. He had lots and lots of white blood cells and a high percentage of neutrophils. And then when they looked at his immunoglobulins, everything was virtually undetectable. He had no IgG 
that could be measured, no IgA that could be measured, and a fit amount of IgM. And then to get to your question about vaccination, this child at 12 months and had vaccines at two months, at four months, and six months. He'd been vaccinated for diphtheria, for tetanus, that was pre prevnar days. Um, and he, he got him off with influenza. And when they looked, he, he should have had floating antibodies in response to those vaccines, and he had none. There was no measurable antibody to tetanus, no measurable antibody to diphtheria. And then, of course, the kicker, was that he had no B lymphocytes that were measurable in his blood. So this was an absolute slam dunk diagnosis for XLA. All right, so the kinds of things that patients in X with XLA have are sort of the whole respiratory picture. They have frequent ear infections, they have pneumonia, they have infections of their sinuses. Some of them will get conjunctivitis, whether it's bacterial or viral conjunctivitis, inflammation of the conjunctiva of the eyes, skin infections are common, and gastroenteritis, not so common, but any kind of a pattern is, is, is what we look for, not necessarily the kind of infection, but the pattern, you know, is, are they always sick? I mean, you get the phone call from the mom or the dad, my kid is always sick, I know there's something wrong. So it, it's the pattern, it can, it, sometimes it can be the severity, um, and sometimes it can even be the actual bug that causes the infection. Is it a common bug? Is it a very unusual bacteria that you wouldn't expect to find? So those are the kinds of things we see. You want to talk about autoimmunity while we're there? Well, you can. I can. What else? Go. It's got a Disney character. Oh, I'm sorry. Power death like tigger. I love it. <laughs> I think that that sort of says it all. Anyway, so <laughs> in the olden days, before I was around, um, people thought that XLA patients couldn't have problems, inflammatory problems that were related to making antibodies to self. Um, if, if you look at patients with common variable immunodeficiency, well, they can't make antibody to foreign things but they're terrific at making antibodies to self. So they have a variety of inflammatory conditions. Um, they can have um, inflammatory bowel disease, they can have psoriasis, they can have low platelet counts or low uh, red blood cell counts. But it used to be thought that XLA patients didn't have those kinds of issues. But we actually have kind of done a little bit of a shift um, and as we've gotten more and more data and talked to more and more patients and really collated the data, we found that there may indeed be autoimmunity in the XLA, XLA patient community. This is data from a, the 11-12 IDF survey of, and these were patients, these were XLA patients, 125-ish, um, and asked what kinds of symptoms do you have, you know, and these are this is the whole laundry list of, of symptoms. Whether these symptoms are indicatory of an inflammatory process or an autoimmune process remains to be seen, but it's interesting that all of these things were reported. So 27% of patients, a quarter of the XLA patients that were surveyed reported that they had chronic diarrhea. Now, did they have chronic diarrhea because they had some infection that was causing their diarrhea? Do they have chronic diarrhea because they had an inflammatory bowel process going on? Do they actually have inflammatory bowel disease? Um, so those were the questions that we were asking. And so the, the issue is, is that the jury is still out in terms of autoimmunity and XLA, XLA patients. But it's very important that you talk to your healthcare provider and you let them know what symptoms you have, what problems you have, and together you work out what are these a symptom of? You know, is it just diarrhea because you have an infection? Is it something bigger that may need more treatment than an infection? So the communication is critical, and as I said, our takeaway is that we've now come to believe that autoimmune conditions are possible in patients with XLA, and they need to be followed and treated appropriately 
which uh, said it's a little bit of a paradigm shift. We're not really sure we were there before. Yeah. Um, that previous slide that you just showed. Can we go back? Those percentages are those of um, uh, are those of uh, people already being treated? These are these are 125 patients who have XLA who are being treated for XLA, right? and that's what they reported. It's just what their physicians or their nurse practitioners or their caregivers reported. That's what, these are the symptoms they reported themselves. So uh, this is a, a controversial area. Actually, I want you to go back to the <laughs> you list. Want me to go back? Yeah, Sorry. Because I, I want to make a few points here. So um, this is one of those areas where um, we get potential information from the um, survey that you fill out from, from joining the um, US ID net and having your data in the database. And I want to just emphasize that that these give us data and give us um, questions to ask for research, but they don't give us answers. So I'm going to just pick one of these. I'm going to pick this one, painful joints. Okay, so um, first of all, you have to remember that this is all self-reporting. Okay, um, and I have to say, I think that there's a, there's a particular bias that people that are doing well may be a little bit less likely to report things than people who are not doing well. Okay, just the same way that when um, the hospital, our hospital passes out survey cards about how people are doing. Um, now, we never get bad reviews, no, yeah, yeah. okay? Yeah. But I can tell you that, like, people will complain because the parking isn't free, or they yeah. complain because we got behind schedule because we had a complicated patient. But very, very few times do people fill out a form to say this was a great visit. And I really don't think it's because they didn't, we don't have mostly patients that have good visits, if not great visits, but it's, that's human nature. Okay, and if you are ever involved in um, a study of a new drug, or if you ever look at the physician's desk, um, uh, the PDR, desk reference, or you go online and you ask what are the side effects of any drug, what are the side effects of aspirin, okay? Any drug at all, if you look at the side effects, you will always see on the list of side effects, colds and headaches. Okay, because guess what? If you put 100 people on a drug for six months and you watch and see what happens to them, some number of them get colds and some number of them get headaches. And you have to have a control group. So if you, if you do a study like that and half the people are getting um, a starch pill, a placebo, and the other half are getting the drug, and you see that the same number of people get colds on, in both groups, then you say, well, that's just people getting colds. If you see that the number of people who have joint symptoms getting no drug or a placebo is 2%, and the number of people getting that symptom on the drug is 30%, then you could be pretty worried that it's due to the drug or due to whatever their disease is. So one of the issues here is that this is all kind of non-selected. And um, so it, and it's not been um, kind of verified by any kind of a healthcare provider to say, does that person have arthritis, All right? Now, the second piece of this is if you take uh, painful joints, there are lots and lots of reasons that somebody with XLA could have painful joints. So one of them could be that, that there is an increased incidence of an autoimmune disease called rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory disease of the joints, okay? Another reason for having painful joints, this is something we learned years and years ago uh, when I was a fellow, okay, is that some people with XLA will get infections with um, organisms called mycoplasma and ureaplasma. They usually cause cough or pneumonia, but in an XLA patient, those germs can go into the joint and they can cause a, a painful arthritis that looks just like anybody else's arthritis. Now, it turns out that urea plasma and mycoplasma are almost impossible to culture. 
And the only way you find those in the joint is you have to do one of those DNA tests. So it's possible that this is rheumatoid arthritis and an autoimmune disease. It's possible that this is due to some infection that we don't know about. I guess it's possible that this could be uh, some kind of a side effect of giving people gamma globulin for 30 years. It's possible that these are kind of aches and pains that lots of people have, and this is not all that different from the baseline. You know, we don't collect information on the siblings of the healthy siblings, or the, the healthy may not be the right word, the siblings who don't have XLA as an example, to know what this number is in their brothers and sisters or in their parents. So uh, this is really important information. It's new information. It's giving us something to really think about. But I'm not yet ready to jump and say that um, XLA patients have a, a, a big problem with inflammatory or autoimmune diseases. I would say the same thing to, to an XLA patient or the family of an XLA patient that I would to anybody else. If you have chronic diarrhea, if you have persistent joint aches, if you have funny rashes, you should be evaluated by a doctor who should have a very open mind about what this could be. And knowing that the, that the person in front of him has XLA may um, increase the things that, that the doctor or the nurse practitioner or whoever the healthcare provider is thinks about. Uh, but it shouldn't automatically, um, nobody should automatically say, well, you have XLA, so you can't possibly have whatever, okay? Now, I think in XLA, you're not going to possibly have an antibody-mediated disease, except that we're giving antibody to all of these people, okay? So you might be able to get something that's the result of the IgG. We don't know. And I think this is clearly an area where the registry is, gonna, is asking or raising lots and lots of important questions, but you have to be really careful that you don't look at these data and say it's giving us answers. There's a question here. Yeah, I have a question. So aren't some B1 and Yeah, I guess if the symptoms are all gone on gamma globulin, yeah, then I wouldn't start doing, I certainly wouldn't start putting needles into joints and collecting fluid. I mean, that's what you have to do. But if there's no, well, you're trying to get the DNA if, there's an, if there is an infection in the joint, okay? So if he had persistent arthritis, okay, on gamma globulin, then that would be one of the things I might think about doing. But the fact that it all went away, makes me think that in that case, those joint aches were probably related to some infection and the gamma globulin and whatever else has been done has treated it, okay? And I wouldn't be um, very concerned that it's gonna come back, okay? But there's no guarantees, obviously. Yes? I heard that sometimes with XLAs, the T cells overwork because they're trying to somehow work with the B cell do you find that that's part of it, that the T cells are a little off because they're either overworking or there's something different going on with the interaction of the bees or the gamma? I'm not sure I have ever really heard that before, and I'm not exactly sure why. It was explained that there's, you get all your antibodies and you get your IDIG, right? And now the T cells are thinking something's going on. Why are all these antibodies suddenly in the system? And they might start to survey, start looking, and then end up going autoimmune because there's nothing really there for them to, to go after. Yeah, so the, the first thing is that, um, that T cells as a rule don't usually see soluble proteins, like proteins just floating in the blood. They tend to see things on the surfaces of cells or inside of cells as opposed to stuff out in the, that's usually what antibody does. 
The second thing is that the, when you get IVIG, there are very, very, very few differences in the IgG molecules that any of us make compared to anybody else's. It's not like blood types where there's a big difference between type A and type B. Um, there are a few differences, so um, there are what we call allotypic differences. So your IgG at one specific spot might have a, an alanine instead of a valine, so a one amino acid difference, which tends not to be very, um, doesn't usually tend to induce any kind of antibody response. Um, and when you're getting gamma globulin, if you're getting it on a regular basis, you always have antibody, and I'm not sure that you're getting, it's not like you're on zero and suddenly getting a lot. So that theory, I'm not sure that it holds, but if it does, I would be more worried maybe the first dose or two, but not after you're kind of at a baseline. But I, I don't know, I don't know any, I've never heard that before. And I'm not sure I know any experimental data to support it, but it might be, and there are always things that I don't know about. Thank you. Yes. Um, can we go back to the last slide, please? Which one? Um, about Hopson. Okay. Um, I just had a question, kind of a multifaceted question. Sure. But uh, I, I know that different people have different, I believe in oxygen cancer, basically. Uh, you know, one thing can cause but I have a dual diagnosis with my stomach. Um, I have uh, gastroparalysis, et cetera. Um, now, is that considered dual diagnosis, or is there more of a likelihood that this would cause that? And then also, is this more of, I mean, I don't just credit the, the condition fibromyalgia, but I know it's very kind of vague Just to go back, these are self-reports of patients. Yeah. Just symptoms, not diagnosis. Okay. You know, just because someone has chronic headaches doesn't mean they have migraines. Oh, that's right. You know, just because someone had uh, abdominal pain doesn't mean they have an appendicitis. These are just symptoms, and nobody knows, as Howard said, because of the whole reporting mechanism, exactly what those symptoms mean. So that could be a bad thing. That could be a bad thing. Yeah. Sure. Well, that, that, then it gets more complicated. So, you know, um, lots of people have, um, I'm going to come up, have thyroid disease, okay? Uh, one in ten women will develop breast cancer, okay? Well, maybe I shouldn't have taken something for women. One in, I don't know, let's say one in, one in ten men will get prostate cancer, one in 12, one in 14. So if you have XLA, and, and when you're 50 or 60, you developed prostate cancer. That doesn't mean that you got prostate cancer because you have XLA, mm -hmm. okay? You have XLA and you have prostate cancer. There are people who develop diabetes, okay? You could be overweight and have XLA. You could have high blood pressure and you could have XLA, but it doesn't mean that there's cause and effect. So you have to be really careful about how you parse these things out. Yeah. yeah, you know, people who have lots of infections and end up with lots of antibiotics sometimes get GI stuff, okay? Sometimes they get um, gastroparesis, sometimes they end up with, with uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and that's not really, it's not a direct consequence of having XLA, it's having lots of antibiotic exposure. Now there's lots of people who get lots of antibiotics who don't get those things. And my bet is that the people who develop uh, whatever that chronic GI problem is, let's say it's, it's um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, maybe they have a genetic predisposition for that, and then they got a lot of antibiotics and that pushed them over, okay? Maybe somebody has a genetic predisposition for diabetes, okay, they have XLA and they overeat and they get really obese and that brings out their diabetes, but it's not related to the XLA. They have the 
So I don't, I don't want to start making specific I, I recommendations about specific sorry. people, but I'm, what, I, what I'm saying is um, because somebody has XLA or because somebody doesn't have XLA, mm -hmm. if I had a patient who came in to me with chronic diarrhea, it needs to be investigated. You need to figure out what it is. There's lots of things that could cause chronic diarrhea. Because you have a patient with XLA, certain things might be higher or lower on your list. Okay, so uh, some kind of an infection would be, almost certainly is gonna be higher on my list in a patient with XLA than a typical person coming in. Okay, but if you look for infections and you don't find them, then you have to think about other things. Okay, because the person has XLA, I'm gonna look for infections by um, getting cultures, by getting DNA tests, maybe by getting a piece of tissue. I'm, because they have XLA, I'm not, gonna be getting, I'm not gonna be testing for infections with an antibody test, but it doesn't mean I'm not gonna be testing for infections. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you still have um, some um, problems, for example, in sinus problems, because you still have all the uh, other AIG letters. But I was curious that in your reporting um, uh, information, is it, I didn't see anything on sinus specific things, and I thought that most of the XLA people would have some sort of a sinus, so if you look back on our list, this goes back wait, when you're talking about infections that are common in people with XLA, sinusitis. No, no, get off of this list. This is this list. No, no, but this, this list really was put together mostly for these kind of autoimmune diseases. But if you look back, so a significant number of people with XLA have problems with sinusitis. Okay. Again, that, that list that Actually, we showed you was sentence. a list that, that, that was not concentrating on infections. That was really asking the question about um, autoimmune or inflammatory diseases. Okay, but for this, for this case, with the sinus, it's just something you have to just live with it. Like, it's not something that you would take as a different... No, so if a patient with XLA or any antibody deficiency has lots of problems with sinusitis, okay? I would deal with them. I wouldn't say that's something you have to live with, okay? So in general, I would ask about whether there are uh, environmental exposures that are like cigarette smoking that's, that's around that's causing a problem, okay? I would um, probably ask one of my colleagues in um, um, otolaryngology to go up in the nose and try to get some material right from a sinus and get a culture and make sure that there's not some germ in there that is um, responding partially to antibiotics but not getting completely cured. I would get a CT scan in somebody who's having recurrent sinusitis to find out if maybe because of all the infections that have gone on, there's some scarring and narrowing of the drainage of the sinuses that sometimes surgery might help. Okay, so uh, absolutely there are some things that are more common in XLA, but I don't think you should ever be in a position of saying, well, my eye or my son has XLA, therefore I know they're gonna just have chronic sinus disease because we have lots of patients with XLA who don't have chronic sinus disease. And I would work really hard to see if I could figure out why it was that that one person was having so much trouble with sinus disease and whether there's some sometimes really simple things that we can do to make it better. Sometimes those are the patients that we switch from IV gamma globulin every three weeks to sub-Q every week because we keep the levels more stable and sometimes that's really important in controlling sinus disease. So there's lots and lots of things that you have to look for. Hold on, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. One quick kind of comment, piece of advice, whatever, uh, back to the, uh, the list of um, symptoms that were reported as well as something that Dr. Budman said. Uh, that survey is a snapshot in time. Exactly. And when you go in to see your immunologist, that is generally a snapshot in time. And one of the things that you said was, hey, you're doing pretty well. 
by and large, I think it's safe to say that people are going to say, oh yeah, I've been doing well. This, um, this is not meant to be an EPHR plug, but for uh, those of us who are of a certain age, and you know, I think we're tough guys who have uh, exolite, as well as the young ones who are growing up and they've kind of been dealing with infections and everything else, there is a, I would argue, maybe a little bit of acclimation to discomfort. And so just tracking and being, if you're an adult with it, being aware, recording it, you know, there are, I mean, I had chronic diarrhea for a long time, and it, and it was actually you know, other issues and things that could be more or less addressed. And there are times when I don't realize how sick I am, because most of the time my wife can see it. Um, I just feel it. And your kids may not be acclimated to telling you about everyday companions. Then again, there are plenty that probably do, but noting this stuff down longitudinally over the course of the year so that when you go and you report something, if you're feeling good right now, at that time, you're going to say, oh yeah, I've been doing pretty well. You forget about the bad things or you never really kind of owned up to it. So just a general thought, and that really goes for everyone, you know, especially with an antibody deficiency or everyone in this conference. So let's reach to get you just care now that we've beating all the infections to them. Mm -hmm. So the important thing is that routine health maintenance is, doesn't need to go by the wayside just because you're dealing with a chronic illness. All of the things you normally need, you know, uh, if you're an adult, colonoscopy every 10 years, you know, your, your annual checkup to make sure that things are going, all those things are just as important for a patient with XLA as they are for immunocompetent people. The important thing to know is that routine vaccinations are not necessary. You know, I talk about phone calls that I get all the time. I must get at least one a week. You know, well, my doc, my primary care doctor wants to give me, wants me to get the new pneumonia vaccine. You don't need the new pneumonia vaccine. You don't respond to vaccines. It's going to give you a sore arm and nothing else. Or, or the call in the middle of the night from somebody who's in an emergency room and they whip out the tetanus shot. No, you don't need a tetanus shot. You probably have more floating tetanus antibodies than any 69 other people put together. The difference, or rather the exception, is the influenza vaccine. Um, and that's a little bit of a catch-22. The thing to understand is that the gamma globulin that you're giving yourself today, that plasma was collected 24 months ago. So the antibody in that gamma globulin reflects the antibody that was circulating two years ago. So flu strains change every year. And the amount and the flu antibody in the gamma globulin reflects what the flu strain that was that year and what people were vaccinated against. The best example is the year that's the first swine flu year. There was no swine flu antibody in gamma globulin. So lots of patients who were getting therapy got swine flu because we weren't protecting them with the gamma globulin. Now, of course, everybody's either had it or been vaccinated, so there's Google the swine flu uh, antibody in gamma globulin. So the flu vaccine works a little bit differently than the tetanus vaccine, and there may indeed be some T cell action. And so we, we recommend, and I think most of our colleagues recommend, that either patients on gamma globulin and XLA patients get that influenza vaccine annually. We figure it's a quick response instead of a no response. But it's fair to say that there's absolutely no data to support that. To say that, yeah. It, it's just a, we think it might work, so let's go for it. In this case, the sore arm is probably okay for a couple of days. Live viral vaccines, <coughs> however, are absolutely contraindicated, and that's the measles, mumps, rubella, the Veridex, um, and babies who get rotavirus. So those are absolutely, those are live viruses. And there's a small risk of getting the disease if, if one were to get those vaccines. We already beat genetic counseling to death, so I'm going to move on here. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about Bob's tower? Yeah, so um, when you're missing antibody, I think I mentioned this before, there's certain kinds of, um, of germs that are more likely to cause a problem. So bacteria that have what's called a capsule. So uh, when white cells smell bacteria and they go to grab them, um, bacteria have evolved what's called a capsule, which is this slippery, slimy polysaccharide on the outside of the bacteria. 
And when the white fellow goes to grab a hold of it, it's kind of like trying to grab a, uh, a grief pig and it just slips away. And um, antibody is really important for making that slippery surface sticky and, and easy to grab. So uh, when we give the um, pneumococcal vaccine to people and they make antibody, that antibody is to, against the capsule. And then if they get exposed to the pneumococcus, the antibody attaches to the capsule and the neutrophil, when it comes around, actually doesn't grab the bacteria, it grabs the antibody that's kind of sticking onto it. So if you're missing antibody, you have trouble with those kinds of encapsulated bacteria, which is why before people get gamma globulin, pneumococcus, Haemophilus influenza or the Hib vaccine, Pseudomonas are, are pretty common problems. Gamma globulin supplies antibody and it's, it's very good for particularly the pneumococci and the Haemophilus influenza and in cutting down that risk. Um, the other, I think I already mentioned mycoplasma when we were talking about arthritis. And then um, there are lots of viruses um, that we are susceptible to. And um, I would say that not only recovery from, but particularly reinfection is prevented by antibody. So if you think about it, lots of times there's a cold in the family and the adults get sneezing and maybe some cough and the middle school kids maybe get the same thing, a little sore throat, but if there's a little baby in the house who gets the same cold, they get that plus they get a fever of 102 or 103 because it's the first time they're seeing that virus or any virus like it and they are having a, a stronger immune response to it. As you get experience with lots of colds, you go to daycare, you have older sibs, you go to um, uh, preschool, you start getting uh, antibodies that are in the system that, that even if they're not specific for every virus that you see, they may be um, antibodies to cousins of some of those viruses, so they give you some protection. And you typically tend not to get such a severe infection because you have some immunity already. Um, so people with, um, with XLA are more susceptible to a variety of viruses. And in general, on this whole list, what you have to keep in mind is that the gamma globulin protects you from the kinds of germs that are common in the population and therefore that lots and lots of people have antibody against. So I can tell you, as Beth just said, there is nobody on gamma globulin who's really compliant and gets their infusions who's ever gonna get tetanus because so much of the population is immunized with tetanus. There is a lot of tetanus antibody in the gamma globulin pool and everybody is protected from tetanus, okay? Um, if you go to um, certain parts of the world where yellow fever is prevalent, okay, there is no antibody in the United States gamma globulin to yellow fever. And the yellow fever vaccine is not going to work because you're not going to make antibody to it. So my advice is don't go there. <laughs> All right? If you want to travel someplace where there's malaria, no problem. Okay, because your host defense against malaria doesn't depend on an antibody. Okay, and because when you go to an area where there's a lot of malaria, people tell you to use um, um, sprays to keep the bugs off and you wear long sleeve clothes and you don't wear shorts. And uh, if the risk is really high, you may be on something like chloroquine or some other anti-malarial drug. And that's your risk with XLA is not gonna be any, any more or less. Okay, but um, so these are all, for the most part, these are not exotic kind of infections. They're kind of typical things that occur to everybody and what happens in XLA before you, people are diagnosed is <coughs> you tend to get them over and over and over again or you get more of them or they get to be more severe. Uh, but um, the, the caveat to this is um, if you have XLA and you're on gamma globulin and you wanna take a trip someplace where anybody else is getting vaccines, talk to your doctor specifically about where you wanna go and figure out whether your gamma globulin is providing protection or you need something else or maybe you shouldn't go there. I'm yeah. sorry to ask that. I know that sounds silly. But no, there is. Okay. Gamma globulin reflects the antibodies yeah. in okay. any given population. Okay. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about treatment. Okay, so the gold standard treatment of XLA is absolutely the antibody that you can't, do, that you can't make for yourself. Um, so you give IVIG every three to four weeks, sometimes as frequently as every two weeks, depending on what you need. You give subcutaneous gamma globulin. Believe it or not, that can be given every day or anything up to every 14 days. Or the facilitated subcutaneous product, which was initially put out to get every three to four weeks, but people are now giving it every two to three weeks. So there's lots and lots of different ways to get gamma globulin. And there's lots of decisions to be made about getting gamma globulin. Which route are you going to use? What product are you going to use? What's your regimen going to look like? Where are you going to get it? Those are all decisions that have to be considered. But the important thing is, my first thought, is that those decisions should be made by you in collaboration with whomever is prescribing your immunoglobulin. Nobody should ever write a prescription for gamma globulin and give it to you and send you out the door. Sorry, this should never, ever happen. Someone should explain these are the 39 different ways we can do things. Somebody should ask the question, what is this therapy look like for you? You're going to be doing this for the rest of your life. What it looks like on Tuesday it may be very different than it looks on Saturday, but you need to have that flexibility and you need to be able to make decisions and you need to have all the information you need to make the decision that's right for you. Nobody should make it without you being involved. And I, I mean, I could jump up and down and beat that dead horse forever, but this is terribly, terribly important. Those treatment decisions, you have to be involved in them. So in addition to the gold standard of giving you gamma globulin, there's always a question about what's the role of antibiotics when you don't have infection, antibiotics to protect you from getting infection, called prophylactic antibiotics. So in that same survey that that list of symptoms came from before, 40%, so two out of five XLA patients reported that they were on prophylactic antibiotics. So there's a couple things about that. First of all, if you're one of those 40%, <coughs> who are on prophylactic antibiotics, they do not take the place of immunoglobulin. You can't do Bactrim or gamma globulin or penicillin or gamma globulin. It has to be in addition to the gamma globulin. And the question is, what's the role of prophylactic antibiotics? What, what it, what's trying to be accomplished? Um, as I said, there's kind of two, school, two schools of thought about it. Um, some people feel like, yeah, let's protect you against, let's give you something broad spectrum and protect you against not all infections, but lots of infections. But the question is, is that if you take antibiotics, are you opening yourself up to problems associated with the antibiotics? We talked before about balance um, GI symptoms associated with antibiotics. Those kinds of things are possible. Is it possible to develop organisms that are resistant to common everyday antibiotics. So those are questions, again, that need discussion and thought and shouldn't just be a blanket, this is what we're going to do and this is what we need to do. So going to infection. Obviously, you want to prevent frequent or recurrent infection that might cause long-term organ damage. You can only have so many pneumonias before you do irreversible damage to your lungs. So obviously, you want to jump on infections early and treat them appropriately and not let them linger. And that's important for XLA patients, important for any antibody deficient patient. It's important that you use the appropriate antibiotic. And one of the things that Howard taught me a long time ago was make sure you know what the bug is and get those cultures so that you know what the cause of the organism is. Because not every antibiotic takes care or kills every organism. They're very specific. And, and I always get, you always get a person, I need the really strong antibiotic. Well, one isn't stronger than another. It just depends on what you're trying to kill and what infection you're trying to prevent. So the culture is important if you can get a culture. If you're coughing something up, cough up, or how is it, cockaloogie into a cup, 
they look into the coat, to the lab, and figure out what the bug is so that you can treat it appropriately. And that's really important. So that you can use the right drug for the right bug. Yes, sir. When a patient uh, with XLA picked up a virus that is not in the pool of donors of this immunoglobulin product, what is the uh, um, care that you should provide to this patient? Uh, would, would, would the patient take weeks before cleaning up the virus on its own? Would, what would you do if that happens? So viruses you can't really treat with antibiotics. So you have to treat the symptoms for an effect, a viral infection. So whatever the symptoms are is the treatment you're going to use. But it should run its course and it shouldn't necessarily linger for a go. Oh, okay. okay. Should, should not linger for, for a long time. So the virus will eventually die? It's going to take its natural course, yes. You have, you have lots of defense against viruses. So you have those T cells. You have another cell I never even mentioned called a natural killer cell. Uh, and there's a group of, of uh, proteins floating around in the blood that also have some antiviral effects. So there are still lots of ways that, that um, XLA patients have of getting over viruses. You may have a hard time with viruses. Yeah, there are certain specific viruses that sometimes can be a problem. Um, XLA certainly does not make you any more sensitive to, or susceptible to mycobacteria. Okay. okay. Um, and I don't, it's not 100% clear how to answer the question about C. difficile. So if you have XLA, does everybody know what C. difficile is? So uh, all of us have some spores in our colon um, that are, um, called Clostridium difficile. It's related to the Clostridium that causes botulism. There's a few bacteria that we all have that has that, and they usually don't cause any problems. If you are on lots of antibiotics, you may kill off the um, kind of healthy bacteria that sit there. And when you kill all of that off, there's sometimes a space for the Clostridium to multiply. And then you can get a particularly severe kind of diarrhea that can cause uh, very bad abdominal pain and bleeding because it causes infection in the wall of the intestine. So anybody who's getting lots of antibiotics is more susceptible to C. difficile than somebody who's not. Uh, most XLA patients on gamma globulin tend not to no longer be in the category of so many antibiotics. but. Um, but that, that is a risk. There's also some um, suggestion that if you get C. difficile, part of the way that you get over it is you make antibody to the toxin. And um, it's not 100% sure how much antibody there is in gamma globulin, or if you get it, how much of it leaks into the colon. So there are probably some reasons that people with XLA may either be a little bit more susceptible to get it or a little bit more susceptible to have a severe or prolonged case. Having said that, um, I don't have very many people, nor am I aware that C. difficile is a big problem in XLA. Well, there's lots of bacteria that, that you can get that are resistant to lots of antibiotics that you get when you're in hospitals. Um, when I was in training, uh, we had lots and lots of admissions for people with a gamma globulinemia or common variable immunodeficiency because we didn't have antibiotics that were as good. We didn't have ways of giving home antibiotic therapy. We have very, very fewer admissions to the hospital for people with immunodeficiency, and that's good because the hospital is the, um, the most dangerous place to catch an infection. So, kind of wrap things up with John, excuse me, the blinking red light over here. So, as, as we said, there's no cure for XLA right now, but patients can expect to live relatively normal lives as long as they're on immunoglobulin replacement therapy. Sometimes that, that's the hardest thing to do. You know, if you're starting something that you know you're going to have to do for the rest of your life, 
can be a hard thing to deal with. And, then, and I always talk about my immortal 20-year-old guys, and I send them off to college. They have to sign my blood oath that they're going to do their infusions when they're at college. And they come home and Christmas break, and so how many did you miss? Oh, not many. Tell me really, how many did you miss? And what can we do so that doesn't happen in spring semester? Um, it's, that conversation has to be ongoing, but normal lives are absolutely possible. And again, the, the therapy can be adjusted and can be changed. It doesn't, you know, just because you started IV gamma globulin yesterday doesn't mean you're going to be doing IV gamma globulin for the rest of your life. Therapy can change and there's new things coming out all of the time. That's important to remember so that as your life changes, your therapy can change and can mesh well with what you want to do with your life. And in terms of, of cure, as the previous session, whether you were there or not, gene editing may be the promise of the cure for XLA. Figuring out where the mistake is and editing the gene, correcting the gene, may be the, the end all the gold star that we're, we're shooting for to take care of XLA. We already had 100,000 questions. Go ahead. <laughs> for my clarification, my son is XLA, so his son will be, will not have XLA if his daughter will be care. or may. Will be care. Will be care. Wait, will, will or may? Will. 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 100%. 100% will. Okay. Well, I think Eight cells. When the baby's conceiving, the, the vision of eight cells. You take one of those cells out. Does that prevent the XLA or an abort or does it also no, 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 no. Take the one cell off in order to be able to test that fertilized egg, that embryo, to see if that if that embryo is affected or not. That doesn't get rid of XLA. The gene therapy for XLA is not being as fast as for others because of the benefit of the health and well, what is holding that to go much farther than, than what it's going right now? It's because of what Howard said earlier in terms of when you put this beak, when you put it back in, it's on all the time. And if you cell function is something you don't want on all the time, you want to be able, want to, be able to turn it off or turn it on like a light. You don't want the light shining all the time. If the light were shining all the time, that would lead conceivably to, the, to cells over proliferating and the cancer being caused. But research is probably going to, to control the on and off feature of that. Hopefully, okay, yes. That, that's the sticking point. It's that I, regulatory thing at this point in time. Yeah, I think the gene therapy for XLA would probably be <clears throat> trying to actually repair the specific mutation rather than to insert a whole new gene. It's a little bit trickier than some of the other gene therapy, and I just have to say that just in the last couple of years that we've been able to do gene therapy effectively and safely for, uh, for two immunodeficiency diseases. But the principles that we're learning are gonna allow us to do this for other diseases. So it's gonna happen, but it's, but XLA is, is more tricky than some but it will be not I, you know, I wouldn't even want to give you a guess about a time frame. Sometimes things that we think are just not going to happen, happen next week. And sometimes the gene therapy, to be perfectly honest, people had thought about gene therapy and started doing this in the laboratory 25 years ago. It took a long, 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 long time until it was finally ready to be done in people. And when it was done in people, there were unexpected, really terrible complications with cancer, and the whole thing stopped. And it's now just kind of restarting. So um, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult to predict. Yes. May I ask a question regarding the hepatitis B vaccine and the Gardasil vaccine in SLA boys? Is that something they should be getting? So, um, Hepatitis B vaccine is absolutely unnecessary because there is lots and lots and lots of antibody in the, um, uh, in the gamma globulin. 
so there is no need at all for that, okay? Um, Gardasil is a question that's very difficult to answer. Uh, it's not clear exactly what part of the immune system is stimulated. It's probably more T cell than B cell. And um, I'm not gonna make a general comment about Gardasil. Okay, uh, I think you have to, that's a question you have to ask your doctor with your particular um, child. Go ahead. I do have a quick lifestyle question. So I really remember what you recommend your patient and as far as travel goes. I know we talked about some of the more third world countries and things like that, but what about like, people traveling like Mexico or on a cruise or some of the things that I see with little ones, normal families are doing that I've always thought, eh, we probably shouldn't be doing that because, who knows? You know, and the dumb places to go. Yeah, but, you know, we could tell you the story, and, you know, if we have 13 other providers in the room, we'll tell you that once you get on gamma glycogen, you're stronger and you're better than you ever were before, and a mom or dad will come in with their XLA kid, and they'll say, oh, we had such a winter. All the kids in the house were sick, I had to run around taking care of them, they the time. Tommy didn't miss a day of school. He mm hadn't -hmm. used so much as a Kleenex or shovel nose, and I can't believe it. Can I give all my kids a gamma glycogen? <laughs> <laughs> no, get me. But, but normal things are absolutely, your life should not be negatively impacted. And if it is, then we need to go back and look at how we're treating, what we're doing, because life should happen. Yeah. I feel really strongly about that. I mean, you know, to answer some of the specific questions, like, you know, people worry about if you go to Mexico, whether you're gonna get something in the water, okay? So that can happen to anybody with or without a gamma globulinemia. And, um, you know, lots of times um, we either send patients, if they're, if they're going to Mexico um, with a actually some pills in case they get what's called traveler's diarrhea and uh, that should be just as successful to treat a bacterial infection in somebody with XLA as it is with anybody else, okay? Um, if I had somebody with antibody deficiency who was a female thinking about getting pregnant, I would be at least as nervous about having them go to a Zika area, okay, okay as somebody else, but, but I'd be nervous about having somebody who's um, you know, trying to get pregnant or already pregnant, going to is a, an area where there's lots of Zika virus now, no matter what. Um, we don't know what Zika virus does to a uh, antibody deficient male. Okay, my suspicion is probably not much. It's probably going to be one of those kind of run-of-the-mill viruses and not be a big deal. I'm not sure I would, if there was a, an outbreak of Zika uh, in Brazil, I probably wouldn't go to Brazil at the time when there was an outbreak, okay? But it wouldn't keep me from going to Brazil at a time when the disease is pretty quiescent. Any of the IgE products, it's just IgG, right? Yeah, they're 99% IgG. So we're deficient in IgA and like IgM also? So what are the roles of IgM and IgM so, inside the body? To go back, IgM is a big non-specific molecule. Mm -hmm. The first time you are exposed to something, you make IgM, and then your body's like, oh, I, that's tetanus, I know what tetanus is. And then IgM converts itself into IgG. Okay. So your IgG is your money molecule, you don't forget the delay expression. The role of IgA is a little bit less well understood. You know that IgA covers the mucosal surfaces. Um, it has some role in, in protecting those surfaces. Um, you can't replace IgA, and <coughs> if I can just take a step backwards, people that are IgA deficient, most of them have no idea they're IgA deficient. They, they're completely asymptomatic. They only find out they're IgA deficient when you're screening for something else, like celiac disease. So nobody is really, really clear how important IgA is. We know that IgG is, again, the money molecule, and that's what we give you. We give you those specific antibodies that you need. All right, thank you.
All right. Um, we are kind of at the end of the session here. I know that there was a question, but like, oh, we got so much time. I know. Time. Are we like, what are we going to do for two hours? Amazing question. <laughs> so uh, right now it is lunchtime. Uh, you know, obviously, we need to thank the <laughs>